Bé, bona tarda a tothom. Comencem. Benvinguts a aquest, a aquest cicle de seminaris uh, web que fem des de l'Escola d'Administració Pública de Catalunya. Hem dissenyat aquest cicle de seminaris dintre del Pla de Desenvolupament de la Cultura de la Innovació i el coordinador d'aquests seminaris és l'Albert Caniguiral, que, que ens acompanya avui i presentarà també a la, a la ponent. Bé, aquest cicle de seminaris, com us deia, forma part no, del, del Pla de Desenvolupament de la Cultura de la Innovació que amb des de doncs, píndoles d'autoaprenentatge que tenim, eh, emanem també del marc competencial del perfil innovador a les administracions públiques, tenim un mòdul d'innovació per directius que justament en aquests moments s'està desenvolupant i que tenim diverses actuacions. En aquests moments doncs, ens va, se'ns va plantejar no, que havíem de reflexionar sobre els grans reptes socials i, i de país i, de, i, de, i mundials que tenim davant de, 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 de les crisis que, que tenim en aquests moments davant. No? Per això hem anomenat doncs, com fer evolucionar les administracions, les institucions públiques a l'època de la, de la policrisi. Hem fet dos seminaris dintre d'aquest cicle de cinc, el del Giulio Quagiotto i el de la Pia Andrius. Els dos els teniu disponibles a la pàgina web de, de l'escola, els podeu escoltar, veient els vídeos a penjats i també doncs, un, blog, un, un post al blog fet per l'Albert amb el contingut d'aquests, d'aquestes dues conferències. Avui tenim la, la Bet Nove, que és un plaer tenir-la amb nosaltres i un gran, bueno, una gran com es diu, um, institució que, que ens ve a parlar, no? gairebé de, per dir-ho d'aquesta manera, doncs, posar-la en context perquè bueno, ens fa molta il·lusió tenir-la i eh, tindrem dos seminaris més que també el, el Albert us anirà introduint. Ja estem gairebé una 100 pers- més de 100 persones a dintre del, del seminari, per tant, Albert, quan vulguis, doncs, endavant. I moltes gràcies a tothom. Moltes gràcies. Un plaer també tornar a trobar-nos en aquest uh, seminari. Um... Com bé comentàveu, aquest és el tercer seminari de, del cicle sobre innovació pública. Um, totes les xerrades queden gravades al canal de YouTube de, de l'escola i la podreu recuperar en breu uh, o la podreu reenviar també qui vulgueu. Uh, recordar-vos que tenim interpretació en directe en català. Mm, per accedir-hi podeu apretar uh, la barra d'eines que teniu a sota aquí a l'eina de Zoom, la bola del món, i seleccionar el català. I en aquest cas, el millor és que silencieu l'àudio original, si en teniu una mica de, de barreja. En finalitzar la ponència, també us deixem alguns minuts um, per tal de poder doncs, fer una mica de preguntes i respostes, una mica de diàleg, com vam fer en altres ocasions. Per fer això, us demanem que deixeu les preguntes a l'àmbit de preguntes i respostes, el que la icona posa una Q i una A, una Q i A. És Questions and Answers, um, que no ho trobareu a, allà sota. No feu servir el xat per fer les preguntes, ja que ens dificulta una mica la, la gestió de les mateixes. El xat serveix més per dubtes tècnics i no us podeu connectar si hi ha algun problema amb la, amb la, amb la imatge, el veu o, o el canal de, del català. I com també s'apuntava, recordar-vos que la propera sessió serà amb el Raül Olivan, ja serà després de les vacances d'estiu, serà el 19, el 19 de setembre i us podreu apuntar doncs, a, també ja de en breus i fins al 16 de setembre, però ja anem fent recordatoris pels, pels diversos canals. I remer és un honor doncs, poder estar acompanyats avui per la professora Beth uh, Simon Novek. Uh, Beth Novek és professora a la Northeastern University, on dirigeix el Burns Center for Social Change i el seu projecte associat The Governance Lab. Entre altres moltíssimes activitats, podem destacar la iniciativa Innovate US de GovLab, que forma professionals del sector públic en habilitats d'intel·ligència artificial, cultura i eines digitals i innovació. A la mateixa Northeastern University, la professora també participa a l'Institut for Experiential AI, a la Facultat de Dret, a la Facultat de Ciències Socials i Humanitats, la Facultat d'Arts, Disseny i Mitjans de Comunicació i a la Facultat d'Enginyeria, que té moltíssima activitat. També és professora afiliada de la Cowrie College of Computer Sciences. Um, el treball de la Beth Simon Novex s'ha centrat sobretot a utilitzar o centra sobretot a utilitzar l'intel·ligència artificial per reimaginar la democràcia participativa i enfortir la governança. Ha dedicat la seva carrera a ajudar les institucions a incorporar maneres de treballar més equitatives i obertes mitjançant les noves tecnologies. 
El seu llibre més recent, Democracy Rebooted, How AI Can Save Democracy, es publicarà amb Yale Press pròximament. També és autora de tres llibres anteriors, del que destaquem Solving Public Problems, How to Fix Our Government and Change Our World, del 2021, que va ser nomenat el millor llibre de l'any per la Stanford Social Innovation Review. I, per acabar aquesta superinteressant biografia, comentar que la que la Beth Novick va servir a la Casa Blanca com a primera subdirectora de tecnologia dels Estats Units durant la presidència del president Obama. Va fundar la iniciativa de govern obert de la Casa Blanca, on va crear polítiques i plataformes molt innovadores com data.gov o challenge.gov i va permetre, va transformar el govern federal de manera que fos més transparent, participatiu i col·laboratiu. Podeu seguir totes les seves activitats i publicacions a la web de rebootdemocracy.ai i us recomano també seguir-la a les xarxes socials, on és molt activa i molt interessant. Abans de donar pas a la conferència de la professora Simon Novek, recordar-vos això. Teniu la iconeta a baix de la bola del món per si voleu fer la interpretació en català. Podeu deixar les vostres preguntes a la secció de preguntes i respostes amb la icona de Q&A i els ruptes tècnics, en aquest cas, a través del xat. And with no further ado, I'm happy to welcome uh, Beth Novak and looking forward to hear what you're going to share and then to have an OPEC conversation with the more than 150 participants that we have now already in the, in the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here and thank you to the translators for uh, doing the hard work here. Um, I'm gonna start, let me just share some slides. Uh, that to hopefully make this more visually engaging. Bear with me one moment. I'm not sure about being called an institution. That makes me feel rather old, but um, hopefully in our discussion about new technology, we can all feel quite at the beginning, quite youthful uh, because these tools are all so new and we're all learning together. And that's what I hope for us to talk about today is the ways in which we can think about using AI to respond to the crisis of government, of governance, and of democracy that we are facing around the world. So there is a lot of talk, at least in the United States, about this crisis of democracy in particular. Uh, it is not surprising, given the fact that most people in the United States now say uh, that they are quite dissatisfied with the way our democracy is working. Um, the numbers are low and getting lower. That translates into very low rates of trust in government. Spain does not fare so well. These, this poll is a little bit old, um, but as you can see, Spain is uh, quite towards the bottom of this list, not towards the top. And I don't know about Pia, but I saw Julio cite many of the same numbers in his talk that I watched. Um, it is not an uncommon phenomenon around the world. It's not unique to the United States or to Spain, uh, all over the world. It's only a minority of people who have very high rates of trust in their democratic government. And people, again, everywhere are feeling rather fed up with the way that the system is or isn't working for them. And the perception, again, is that it's government isn't working, and perhaps even more dangerously, that democracy is not working. I want to spend most of my time today really talking about solutions. So I'm not going to spend as much time diagnosing and describing all the root causes of the problem, but it surely is the central narrative right now in the run-up to an election in the United States. So very intentionally, the conversation that I would say the White House is um, kind of characterizing is the choice not just between two candidates, but the narrative, the framing is that we are choosing between democracy and authoritarianism. So the White House is at every opportunity talking about this crisis of democracy, uh, in the hope of persuading the many, many people who intend to vote again for Donald Trump, um, that a vote for Donald Trump is a vote against democracy. So again, there are many reasons uh, we are experiencing this phenomenon, uh, but the, the, the reality is 
that populist demagogues, uh, that authoritarian or proto-authoritarian leaders have obviously become recently increasingly popular. Um, and in the United States, again, the latest poll numbers show that uh, uh, that the majority of Americans are likely to vote Donald Trump back into office, despite statements that he would become a dictator on the first, this is his own statement, that I will become a dictator on my first day in office. Um, part of that underlying feeling of why people feel such distrust is because they have such some few opportunities to participate in governing. So if we think about democracy, and it has many different definitions, as the opportunity to participate in some way in the decisions that affect our lives, most people say, and globally this is the case, and in the US even more so, that they don't have a say, and the governments are not likely to listen to people. And the reality is, and there's really good data in the US that shows that the average person has very, very, as it says here, little or no influence on policymaking processes. That has a lot to do with the money in our political system. It has to do with the way that voting works in our system. But there is a definite sense that our systems of governing and governance have been disconnected from public opinion and that people have very little say. Obviously, social media and the technologies that we use today have played a role in this. Uh, I love this article from The Atlantic magazine that describes social media. I don't know if this translates well, this expression, as democracy's dumpster fire. In other words, uh, it is a complete disaster what happens on social media. Uh, in terms of the misinformation, the disinformation, the echo chambers, the fact that now instead of talking to people in our own, in diverse people and neighbors in our communities, we are instead talking uh, to a broader group of people across wider geographies, but people who tend to agree with us. So again, as I said, I won't spend a lot of time on the issues of crisis, which I know other speakers have dealt with. What I wanna just get us started with is the argument, and this is the central argument of the book that I'm working on, is that the ultimately the crisis of our democracy comes down to a crisis of institutional effectiveness. That is to say, our institutions of government and governance are not working as well as they need to to respond to the challenges of our time. And Julio talked about climate change and COVID and the other issues we know we are facing, we are not up to the task. Now, I am perhaps not simply an optimist, maybe that's the wrong word. I am what the uh, Swedish public health expert and data science expert Hans Rosling referred to as a possibilist. That is not a real English word. That is to say, I am somebody who believes in the possibilities and I am hopeful about what we might be able to do with AI to upgrade and improve the way our institutions work. So in order for, before I sort of dive in more, in order to see whether we're in the same place uh, in this conversation, I'm really interested, and we're gonna send out a poll right now in how many of you are users of AI? Do you use it every day, many times a day? Are you using AI once in a while or have you never tried? And in this case, let me be clear, I'm talking about generative AI tools like ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini. So things that will look like, oops, I'll try to go to the, I think it'll let me go to the next slide. Uh, oh, it's not my next uh, slide. I will I will show you the next slide in a moment. But uh, I have uh, uh, slide with the products. Yes. No, I'm not sure that the poll the poll is up for everybody, so people are answering. I don't know if you see that. So I, uh, I see people answering. Okay, so I, the... almost, uh, I see some people answering. We have about looks like we have seventy eight percent of people have responded. So we can probably end the poll now that most people have responded. We're almost up to everybody. Um, shall I go ahead and, oh, 
So you should all be able to see the answers now, but we have a very small minority of people using it all the time. And we have a good chunk of people here who have never tried it. And so it looks like about half of people um, have really don't use it at all in their work. Um, and a very, very small minority of people are very frequent users. And please feel free to talk about how you're using it or why you're not using it in the chat as we go along. Uh, so we can have as much conversation as possible. So because we have a lot of people here who are new to AI, uh, and again, with generative AI, all of us are new to it. Let me just very quickly say a word about what AI is, because I think the term artificial intelligence, and I will, sorry, let me end the, oops, let's end the poll. End. I'm going to close the poll if I can. Hopefully you're not seeing it now and you see the slides. I, what I want you to take away is simply the idea that these are very good tools for processing data. Uh, so they are no more, and I use this definition here from IBM, but it is basically just using computer, using computers and using really good software to process a lot of data. I think the term intelligence and artificial intelligence makes us think about, you know, uh, very science, so very science fiction possibilities. It makes us think these technologies are somehow alive or human. They are not. Um, now they are more than just a calculator, but I think it helps for us to recognize that they are tools and they are tools for processing data. We have been using AI for a very, very long time. So it's obviously in your phone. If you ever talk to your phone, you've been using AI. Uh, I have, if I say her name, the Amazon device, she will start talking in the background. I, she gives me the weather and the time all the time. So we are using AI all the time, but we're, and we're not even aware of it. And that's only going to become more the case. For the last 15 years, machine learning has become very, very common. And in brief, machine learning is basically a process where you give a piece of software a large quantity of data, you tell it what to look for uh, in what is called supervised machine learning, and then it can spot future examples. Let me give you an example of what I mean. It is very common in healthcare. And at MIT, there is a wonderful uh, professor there named Regina Barzilai, who has developed a new test for breast cancer by giving a piece of software, thousands and thousands of examples of pictures of cancerous tumors. And then the software, by looking at all the examples, is able then to look at the next X-ray and the next X-ray and say, that looks like cancer or that doesn't look like cancer. That is the simple idea behind machine learning. We give something a bunch of examples and then from those examples, the machine learns to spot a pattern. Generative AI, which has been around now only not even a year and a half really in commercial use, it's been around longer than that, uh, in computer science, but for all of us, it's been available about a, since last November, December. It is an example of machine learning, except instead of giving the software uh, just numbers, we are giving the software billions and billions of words. And in the same way that a child learns how to speak, based on listening to its parents, we listen, children listen to the parent, the patterns in the language from parents, generative AI is doing the same thing. It looks at the patterns in the words or in images, and then it is able to predict what the next word should be. So as a result, generative AI like ChatGPT can do things like produce very elegant English or Spanish or other language. This is an example of Chat GPT, helping my child to study for his physics test in school. Tell me the different types of energy and it spits out the different types of energy. Even more exciting, 
he says to it, give me 10 quiz questions. Don't tell me the answers. Instead, give me the questions and help me study for my test. So it's wonderful at producing contact content. Oh, here's my slide I was looking for. And there are a number of different tools, free uh, and paid, uh, that allow us to do this kind of work with content. What I think is so exciting about generative AI is not simply that it helps us to create new content and therefore draft, you know, write or brainstorm or edit. What's even more exciting about these tools is that I can also synthesize, analyze, and manipulate content in new ways to do things like summarize content or analyze it or do research. And as we'll talk about in a moment, the next generation of these tools called AI agents are going to make this kind of process and work with content even easier. So the argument I wanna make for you today is that responsible and ethical use of these tools are going and are already helping us to work better in government. And the this generation of these tools uh, are the worst they're ever going to be. They're, oh, they're going to keep getting better and become even more powerful at helping us to do our work in government. They're going to change the way that governing institutions use information, the way that we engage with the public, and the way that we engage in decision-making and problem-solving. Right now, our institutions have a great deal of difficulty. We have too much information and not, and not enough ability to make use of it. We have trouble engaging with the public because it's too, again, too much information, too many comments, too many people talking and very hard to listen. Oops, sorry, type bad spelling here, strange spelling. Uh, and we have very outdated ways of doing our decision-making. And AI will help us to change that by making it easier. So let me give you some examples, all related to what I'll call the executive branch of government, but we could just as easily have examples about legislatures or courts and the way that they're doing similar things. There are a lot of books out there, and I will try to put a link. Solving Public Problems is available in Spanish as well. So I'll try, or maybe someone will find the link to that and I'll put it in the chat. Um, is that we are not doing as good a job as we need to, obviously better than we used to, but we're not doing as good a job as we need to. And AI can help us to do that differently. In California, for example, where there has been a terrible problem with fires over the last wildfires, forest fires for the last number of years because of climate change. They are using AI now to be able to predict and prevent wildfires. You remember what I told you about machine learning. Well, they fed a piece of software with thousands of examples of pictures of fires and now using 150 cameras, which are taking pictures of forests around California, the AI is able to say, ah, there is a fire about to happen. There is a fire and there is a fire. And they have been able to call the fire department much earlier than if we were waiting for a human to actually spot those fires and put them out before they start avoiding the damage. There are countless communities now turning to the use of chatbots, ability to use AI, again, to manipulate information, to give people answers to their questions, not nine to five when a government office is open, but 24 hours a day. This week, I heard a presentation from the mayor of this town, the borough of Prospect Park, this is a town with 6,000 people in it. And yet, despite having only 6,000 people and a very, very small government, they provide answers to people's questions about where do I get my marriage license and how do I pay my taxes? They're able to do that 24 seven by, and create a more conversational and accessible government using AI. 
In the state of New Jersey, where I uh, am an advisor to the governor on AI, we're not only using AI to provide services 24 seven, we're using AI to provide more customized services. So now using this website, mycareer.nj.gov, I can upload my resume, my CV, my curriculum vitae. The system will scan my resume and tell me what my skills are and then make recommendations for what training I should take and provide me information about that training and how I can get subsidies and payment for that training. So customize, personalize advice just for me, not one size fits all. In the state of Ohio, they've just launched an interesting project where they are using AI to analyze all of their regulations and to be able to identify opportunities to streamline and simplify applications, uh, sorry, regulations, to reduce the cost of compliance with those regulations for businesses. Again, this is a very new uh, project that they've just uh, gotten started on, but they're using it to try to make it easier for people to do business. So just a few examples of ways in which people are using uh, AI to process information. Let me give you a few examples about the ways in which we're using AI to process the very specific kind of information, which is comments from citizens, from residents. So there are communities like Hamburg, Germany, where they are using AI on this system called DIPAS, which is their citizen engagement site for urban planning, to be able to better summarize and synthesize the thousands of comments that they are getting in response to questions about land use planning. In the UK, they are doing a project called Consultation Analyzer, where they are building tools, again, to summarize and synthesize comments from citizens, in particular because right now, the UK government estimates that when they do a public consultation and get 30,000 responses, it takes 25 people three months to analyze the data and to write a report as that's now something that you can do in a matter of minutes, which they estimate saving $80 million, uh, sorry, 80 million pounds because of the ability to do that synthesis. MIT has developed a platform called Cortico for helping to do this kind of summary and analysis, not of online comments, but of face-to-face in-person conversations. The device in the middle of the table records what people are saying, and then helps to produce, again, analysis of the comments that can be given back to the public and to government to make these kinds of conversations more accessible. The uh, nonprofit group Citizens Foundation, based in Iceland, uh, builds free and open source software for citizen engagement. Uh, and I have been working with them, for example, to run a national consultation about literacy and why we have such low rates of reading and literacy in the United States. To develop these con this consultation, we used AI to help us write all of the content of making it faster and easier for us now to go out and ask humans the answers to these questions. But again, AI helped us to write the consultation that we then use humans to actually answer. And the wonderful thing is the AI also helps to provide translations of information into simpler language, plain language, as well as into other languages like Spanish. Finally, and I promised to mention this before, uh, AI agents are essentially the next wave of this technology. Very simply, today when I use Claude or ChatGPT or Gemini, I have to give it instructions. I type in instructions, analyze this text or analyze this data. AI agents automate those instructions. So we are using those to help speed up the process of doing citizen engagement in, and I will 
try to be very brief here, but essentially with part of this engagement about reading, we are looking at how we, not just what the asking humans about what the problems are, we are also looking at how to come up with solutions to those problems. So we are using AI very simply to go out and do thousands and thousands and thousands of searches and identify solutions from the internet, narrow down those solutions, and then we can go out and ask humans about those solutions. So again, I won't uh, go into too much detail here. I'm happy to point you to an article and we have a course about how we use AI to do this work of looking for policy solutions involving AI. But suffice it to say, we can automate the process of looking for solutions. So this could allow us to do a whole lot of different things. I won't read this, I'll just leave it on the screen uh, for some suggestions. Uh, and I'll give some more suggestions in a moment, but you can imagine the ways in which we can, again, use all of the data and information that government sits on to be able to provide better services to residents. So if you're thinking about where do I start? <laughs> How would I actually do any of this? What would I start with? The first thing is to actually start to learn how to use these tools for yourself. And we do have, through the work that we're doing at Innovate US, we are soon launching a free course on generative AI for government um, that I will provide links to in the chat. And it's all, again, free and open. We welcome translation into other languages because um, it's really important to understand, again, what these tools can and can't do. But in terms of thinking about the kinds of projects, where could you start? And again, we have very different people on the call here, but there are lots of things that generative AI in particular are really good at. Now here, I'm not talking about the things that you as an individual can do with it. It's very helpful for writing first drafts of memos or writing first drafts of speeches or helping you write an email and things like that. I'm talking about in terms of institutional projects, things that we can do that are very, very useful. Because these are data processing tools, they're really good at, you know, you give it a lot of data and you tell it, uh, help me find the rare events, the examples of fraud or the examples of uh, overspending, for example. You can process large quantities of documents and help you get through, for example, a backlog of waiting applications by helping you to process them. You can do things like, again, identify situations where early intervention is required, like the fire example that I gave you before. And one of my favorite examples, I'll skip to the last one, is the ability to use these tools to train your workers. Because what you can do is feed the AI with all of your policies and your manuals and your uh, uh, regulations and everything your workers need to know and give them a way to ask questions and get smarter faster in a shorter amount of time. Okay, let me wrap up by saying obviously there are risks and we're familiar with many of them. We know the fact that it hallucinates, that you tell it, give me a picture of a watch showing 1 p.m and it gives you a watch showing 10 past 10. And the reason for this uh, is because every picture of every watch on the internet always shows 10 past 10 because that's how advertisers like to show watches. So because all the data going in is watches on 10 past 10, the data coming out is watches that are 10 past 10. So it makes mistakes. Uh, and it can be uh, uh, it can be very biased. It can discriminate, and it can engage in speech that is complicated. I'm going to go ahead here to a more visual example. If I tell it I want a picture of a surgeon, uh, it usually gives me a picture. If you ask it, give me a picture of a government official or a surgeon or a lawyer. Uh, it used to only ever give you an example of a white man, usually a white man with a beard 
and always a white man with a lot of beautiful, they always have very good hair. Now, uh, thanks to the correction in these that humans have made in these systems, we're getting better. Uh, now it gives you pictures of women and people of color. It does. It still doesn't ever give you anybody who's bald, I've noticed. People always have hair. Uh, we're familiar with the problem of the deep fakes, and we're worried about those in our elections. You probably heard about this example of the Pope in the jacket. This, of course, is a false image. Uh, it wasn't really real. This is kind of cute, but there are obviously more dangerous examples, as we've seen with our elections. And then there are just the weird challenges of a world in which we are able, again, to synthesize and simulate people where we don't know what's real anymore. This comes from a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. And it is what it sounds like. This person does not exist.com is simply pictures of people made by AI, people who do not exist in the world, but who have been generated by AI. So there are a lot of complicated issues. And then there is the challenges, obviously, that arise when we rely excessively on AI. Uh, and we've seen the scandals, whether it's this a scandal that happened in Holland or famously in the scandal that happened in the UK where they relied on a computer system for and the computer system falsely accused uh, the workers in the post office of uh, committing fraud, leading to people not just going to jail but committing suicide. Uh, again, because for 10 years the system failed to scrutinize the technology, relied too much on the technology, and ended up blaming the humans. So there are challenges when we rely too much on the technology. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead here because I want to get to our discussion. Um, so there's a lot of risks which we could talk about. And one of those biggest risks, though, and this is where I want to end, um, is the risk that we will throw up our hands and say, the risks are so great, the dangers are so great, we're not gonna do anything. This is what is sometimes called in English, AI doomerism. The constant warnings, which we hear about all the time, that AI is going to kill everyone, that the robot apocalypse will take over, that all of our jobs will be erased, um, this is where a lot of our policy focuses, it's where a lot of our research is going, it's where a lot of our attention and our media and our narrative is. And I would argue that is getting in the way of our talking about what the opportunities are. Uh, this picture is from a study that came out a few weeks ago that said, AI is giving us bad information about our elections, inaccurate, misleading, harmful information about our elections. But I show this because that same study and all of these articles that talk about how AI is hurting our elections never talk about how we can use AI to help strengthen our democracy or improve our elections. So if we don't want to lose our democracy, I would argue we need to be focusing on how we use AI to actually improve our democratic institutions and how we build AI that helps us get stronger in our and better with our governance, more secure with our democracy, and more effective at solving problems. If we don't, it will be at our own peril. Thank you. Hi, no. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting and informative uh, talk. You get some claps. I will uh, suggest so people can leave their questions on the Q and A to to follow to follow up. I would like especially to stress or uh, to to thank you on stressing that we are all learning. I think that's a very important key message you gave at the at the beginning that we are all new. as Kevin Kelly sometimes says also. No, we are we are and and at the pace that innovations are coming will be just continuous, continual uh, new ways and, 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 and learning. Also, thank you for explaining uh, AI, machine learning, and generative AI in such a clear and uh, 
and, and, and approachable way with a lot of examples and also balancing with the, with the risks. It's not so common to, to have a conversation or a presentation that is striking this, this balance. And uh, last but not least, that's all the topic is very is very close to my heart because I'm working at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, helping to develop some AI like large language models which are centered in Spanish and Catalan language because they are one of the challenges on deploying all that in non-English languages, non-global languages, is that the performance, the security, some of these uh, statistics are way uh, poorer. You know, there's a worse performance in other languages that we call it the AI language gap. Um, so maybe start, I, I will um, maybe start with one or two simple questions. One, one very simple because apart from following your publications uh, and the book that it's, it's coming up and, uh, and the newsletters, uh, what would be your recommendation to keep more or less up to date with all these projects, innovation. We will follow the publications, but if you have any 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 trick, a little bit also to separate the the wheat from the chaff. That's in Spanish would be separar el grano de la paja, no? Because there's such an influx of um, projects that are sometimes difficult to distinguish what's good from what's not so good. It is, and I think all of us are feeling uh, very overwhelmed at the moment. Uh, because there is so much news about AI now, with so much conversation, uh, and it can be very overwhelming. And especially, even or maybe especially if you know something about technology or digital, and you just mastered kind of digital government, now the whole question of AI and government is just um, there is a lot to keep on top of because also the products are changing so fast. Every open AI just announced another model. And then mm. Google had its developer conference last week and they announced new things. And then Facebook has to keep up with Llama. And of course, then in Europe, you have the French also trying to keep up in particular. And there's just so much to do. So the first thing is to take a deep breath and recognize it's not just you, it's everybody feels this way right now. Um, so I put a link in the chat, not, this is not, I, I don't mean to advertise, um, but I have found there is not a lot about the positive questions about AI and democracy or AI and government. So we put out once a week, we put out a collection uh, of news stories. We call it news of the week. So it's not it's not stuff we write. It's what we curate from other sources. Uh, and again, just, you know, all focused on questions of government and governance. And then um, I will put the link again in the chat to Innovate US and to some of the courses. And again, because they're all free and open, we would love for collaboration to put them into Catalan uh, or into Spanish as people prefer uh, and make them available. We've been, we have a workshop every single week. And I will say we are going to have a whole slate of Spanish language programs coming up because also in the US we have so many native Spanish speakers. Um, so we've been identifying people who are native Spanish speakers to do workshops as well. So uh, we would welcome collaboration on that. And those are like this one hour, very quick, and very focused on hands-on skill building. Uh, my internet is doing strange things. So I will, I'll put the main link in the chat. And if someone, it's not letting me load the courses page right now, but I will, uh, I'll do that in a moment um, when I, when it works better. Um, but the short answer is, you know, the most important thing is to try it for yourself. That's the main thing I want to say. You've got to, got to, got to, try these tools for yourself. And there's no longer an excuse of saying, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not technical. These tools are driven by plain language. Any language that you know, you give it instructions in plain language and that's what's so exciting. Okay, let me stop there. We'll yeah. run out of time. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, uh, some questions in the queue. Let me use uh, or raise the ones that are linking very well with what you were saying now. 
So um, what are the roles that do you, do you think are necessary to drive AI between the administration? What are the new roles or capacities that are, that are desirable? I understand that you are working on that. It's a great question. And I will say, um, again, so one thing is that this is something that everybody can learn how to do. So unlike with in the past where we thought about how do we have a digital unit or an innovation unit or a data science team, we all should be looking at how to use these tools to improve our work. That said, the role of data science uh, is it, it, it has been important and is getting has only becoming more important. Um, and data science is not just about the technical or statistical work of manipulating information. It's about the social science question of how do I formulate a hypothesis? So data scientists, if trained well, know how to formulate a question and then, and then ask what data can I use to answer that question? Those roles will be extraordinarily important. And the other role will be people thinking about ethics and how we responsibly use these tools. We didn't talk a lot about that because we don't have a lot of time. When we're talking about, you know, writing a first draft of an email, it's not a big deal. When we're talking about maybe even doing an internal chat bot, like something to answer employee questions, maybe lower risk. When we start to talk about putting using AI to do customer service, to answer citizen questions, and especially if we're talking about using AI to make decisions, to decide what benefit you will get, what service you will get, what check you will get, we need a very, very lot of scrutiny. We've needed that for a long time. And it's not something we can simply write a contract for to a technology company to do for us. It is extremely important, and it always has been, that we have people inside government who have who work in the public interest, who are focused on how do we responsibly and ethically use these tools. So that's a longer topic, but in brief, uh, data science and AI ethics are the two most important things, but all of us need to understand and play with these tools to know what they can do and what they can't do. So again, linking very well with the end of your answer, there's a question um, highlighting that the use of these AI tools from private corporations are very opaque. They, they do not publish their algorithmic codes. And is that a risk to democracy itself? Because we are taking some black boxes into making some of these decisions that you were saying now. What's your approach? Or do you recommend working with open source tools? Because you know, the, in, in, in this amount of things that are happening, one another big stream is the, all the open source movement on the on the AI. So what's your take on that? So absolutely. So it is a big, let me say there's two challenges here. One is that whether the tools are closed source or open source, with the new generative AI tools, nobody understands why they do what they do. In the same way that when your child first learns to speak, you don't quite understand why do they say mama first or papa or train or something completely different. How the language emerges, we don't understand this process entirely. And it's the same thing when you ask ChatGPT to write you a poem, nobody knows quite why it does what it does. There's very interesting research now and a lot of money being spent on trying to understand these processes, like trying to understand how the brain works. This is a big area of research. So that's to one side that we just don't know why it does what it does, but it does some wonderful stuff. However, the issue of uh, commercial companies who will not disclose what is the training data uh, first of all, regulations now in Europe under the EU AI Act will create pressure first in Europe, but then I think globally to force these companies to begin to disclose what the data is that they're using to train their algorithms, number one. 
But the issue of the closed algorithms uh, is why we should prefer open source products. Uh, and we made this mistake with social media where we let companies like Twitter and Facebook control our public square and we did not build public alternatives to these kinds of spaces and we have paid the price now uh, as a result. And so I do think, and Barcelona I might say is the kind of ground zero of open source civic tech uh, with Decidim having been developed um, in Catalonia. Uh, this is probably sort of the, you know, I think of Catalonia as the kind of strongest community around open source civic tech and especially citizen engagement tech. Um, so I have very high hopes uh, and I do think open source models and public models are preferable. That said, again, for some of the uses we're talking about, like I want to simplify some language, it's not, it, it's the same as thinking about using Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word is a word processor from a private company. Does it help me to write good letters? Yes, it, I can write a letter, I can write a poem. Some of these uses we're talking about, again, are low risk. Um, others though, as in that are higher risk, we should definitely prefer models that we can, that are transparent and that we can scrutinize. Thank you. And also you were saying a little bit on the, on the users. There is one question about, uh, uh that last November Porto Alegre city council, uh, city in, in the, in the South of Brazil passed the first, uh, law written by chat GPT. So do you think that's a fair year? What do you think of that? Uh, what are the risks? On, are they relying too much? Because obviously it's, as I said, it's not summarizing something. It's not like doing a first draft. It's actually, uh, or they claim, at least because sometimes the, the, the details are, are where we need to go. But the, high, the, the, the headline was that they were written, writing a law with chat GPT. So what do you and it is, so we should worry if the people passing the law were AI bots, as long as there are humans reading the law and voting on it, um, the fact that some a legislator wanted to get a headline uh, for write, writing the law with ChatGPT right now, who the you know where the legislation is written by interns and assistants. Um, in the United States, we have groups that specialize in writing drafts of the law and giving it to legislators in the hope they will take it and then introduce that law because legislators are too busy to write the law for themselves. What is exciting, so it's a bit of headline grabbing and it's voted on by humans. So I don't think it's that consequential. What I'm much more excited about is that in Brazil, uh, they have been very far out ahead at creating an, uh, an AI tool with their style guide in the Brazilian Senate, so that when somebody drafts a law, they can use AI to correct the draft and make sure it is properly written. They have developed a tool uh, which is helping to, uh, this is in Italy they're doing this, in Brazil they're doing this, in a variety of places. They're using AI to also organize the process of lawmaking. In Italy in particular, People like to introduce amendments, changes to the law, and you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of amendments that are introduced. The ability to organize and sort and coordinate that process and figure out where in the text does the amendment go to compare the legislation against existing legislation. These are all fantastic productivity advances that I think will become common in legislatures in the coming years. And then there are places, for example, like India, where they're using AI to transcribe, to write down and translate all the debates happening in their parliament because they have so many uh, minority languages. They have people speak 22 different dialects that are 22 different languages, or at least they're translating debates into 22 languages. So there's far greater transparency and access to the legislative process uh, that didn't exist before. And I think that is a very exciting advance. Thank you. I think that was an excellent review of what the, what, what the users. Maybe the last question, we have a lot of questions, but grouping two or three questions more on 
what are the limits on the data privacy from the citizen perspective no we we can probably think on very extremely personalized services uh, some of the ones you, you you showed with the cds and and, and job searching and so on uh, but for example in in europe the privacy laws are stronger than the us uh, and despite the government might have this data they, it can only be used for a certain use it cannot be used for a secondary use so um, do you have any recommendation or have you seen any law that strikes a balance between uh, all this public interest, personal interest and government? I don't know. Uh, that's a complicated one. But... Did you want to group two or, th or was it? No, no, that, 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 that's, already that, that grouping, is... that's already grouping two or three questions on data, privacy and uh, EU regulation. Yeah. On um, so the first is... One of the big issues as we think about AI and government, and this gets back to the question about private companies, is that we have policies that are clear uh, and contracts that are clear about how our data and citizen data gets used. So right now, if you use the free version of ChatGPT, uh, you should use it for things that are not confidential or not important. So it's great, write a bed, it's great for writing bedtime stories for children, or you want to ask it for recipes because what you type in, they use to train their algorithm. Now, if you pay for it, you can, you have more control over how your data gets used and one has to be very careful Microsoft just changed in the US, I don't know in Europe, but in the US, they just changed the rules. So the default, that is to say the automatic setting is that they will train on your data unless you tell them not to. So, you know, it's like a game where you have to stay on top of what does the contract say? We have to worry and use our power in government to demand the privacy to which we're entitled and to which our citizens are entitled. But remember, if I'm doing a public consultation with citizens and asking for comment, those comments are public. There isn't an issue about privacy here. They're public. The bigger issue is that we're not listening to citizens because they give us comments and we don't have time to read them. We can't make sense of them. But when I can take all of the comments citizens are typing in and ask AI to summarize them, I don't have a privacy issue. Instead, I have an opportunity to finally listen to what people are telling me. So we just should be careful about not letting privacy stop us from doing some things that we can do right now, but focus our attention then on ensuring we are careful about not putting in confidential data or citizen data, you know, uh, private citizen data or, you know, this data that should be secure, there we need to really demand our rights. And thankfully, Europe is there to save us from the rest of the world and our failure to do this in the United States. Thank you very much. We've reached the, the end of the hour. It has been a pleasure. There are some questions that uh, could, not be, could not be asked, but thank you for all the links. I think we have a lot of um, information to go through and all the examples and uh, it will be very necessary to replay the whole the whole conference because there are so, so many insights. So thank you very much, uh, Beth Novik, for, for, for helping us, uh, for, for sharing your knowledge with us. So. Thank you. And again, thank you to the translators for mm -hmm. making this possible and to, for the invitation. I wish everybody a good afternoon. Uh, I només per tancar, recordar que tenim la propera conferència amb el Raül Oliveran el 19 de setembre i com han compartit ja en el xat, us podeu registrar uh, en aquesta, a, a la web. Així que res, un plaer i moltes gràcies a tothom. Bona tarda. Bye bye.